Hey everyone, welcome to Bible and Archaeology. Six o'clock here on a Friday, a little bit of a different time, but it's been it's been a busy day here for Bible and Archaeology in Iowa. Bob, as he was talking about last week, was doing that senior college talk today, a very good day. As we talked about last week, that's something to keep an eye on for all of you who may want to be able to access that in the future. That could be coming your way, but we're so happy to have you here with us. We know there's a lot going on. Currently, there is a, a South Carolina basketball game that we here in Iowa are very interested in the outcome of <laughs> South Carolina and Indiana as we look across the other half of the bracket. But we're so happy to have you here to talk about the resurrection. That's our main mm -hmm. focus for today. The day, don't worry, the resurrection stories of Jesus and the gospel is what we are here to discuss yep. this afternoon. Iowa doesn't play until tomorrow, so don't worry. You'll hear about the right, Iowa no. basketball game follow-up next week on the live, I'm sure, and hopefully all good things. But Bob, glad to see you. Happy, happy Friday, happy end of the week. Yeah, good Friday and uh, good to see you. And uh, yeah, this will be a good discussion. I'm happy to be here. Yes, good. For, we're we're wrapping up our Easter content for this season. It is Good Friday. We're rolling in to Easter, and we figured what better time to talk about what the Bible does and doesn't say about the resurrection than, you know, before the time that we associate with that. And we're not going to go through all of the resurrection stories. There's right. various resurrection stories in the gospel of figures other than Jesus. There's right. too many to try to all cram into one thing. And because we don't want to do disservice to any of those, today we're going to be focusing on some of the aspects of the resurrection stories in the Gospels with Jesus. We'll come mm -hmm. back to some of those other stories on future days as well. So if you're thinking like, oh, I really wanted to hear about Jairus' daughter and what's happening here, that's a thing that we can definitely come back to on a future day. So keep your eyes out for that. But as always, there's lots of ways to get a hold of us that we want to make you aware of up front. You can always find us at Bible and Archaeology. The link to the website is down below. That gets updated with news stories throughout the day, links to videos and other things that are going on. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter for as long, or X for as long as that continues to be a thing that exists. You can also find <laughs> us on Patreon at Excavator if you want to support us. If you want to join in there, you can submit questions in advance that you know will be answered. You could recommend uh, topics for future episodes. You can be in touch with us there. You can also email us Bible-Archaeology. All of this information is down in the description. There's lots of ways to be in touch with us. And if you're here live for this, you can also be in touch with us in the chat live as we do this. If you have a question, we got a lot to get through, but if you have a question, we'll definitely be keeping an eye there for comments as they come in. We're happy if you're able to join us live. If you're watching on replay, you can leave questions in the comments there too, because the first Friday of every month, we do a questions-only episode, Bible and Archaeology Live, free for all, based on questions that are submitted live during that show, as well as some questions that have come in either in the comments or in emails in the previous month. So that'll be next week's episode. So if you're watching this one on replay and you want to get a question in, go ahead, put it in the chat or put it in the comments, and you may see that in a future Bible and Archaeology. But as usual, before we get into the main topic, we're going to touch on a couple news stories for the week, keep you up to date on everything that's happening in the world of archaeology. And that first news story comes to us from the ongoing excavations at Pompeii, a site that keeps on giving. And this story is about a Roman building site. Now, these photos that you see here, you may think, wait a minute, is, are they building something right now? No. This is a Roman building site that was covered when Vesuvius erupted and the site was buried. And yes, it looks exactly like if you were to walk to a building site today. The archaeologists are very interested in this site, one, because it gives us more insight into the tools and the methods that they used because this construction site was essentially frozen in time. The roof tiles you can see there are stacked up nicely for to be used. They never got to be used but it also gives us more information about Roman concrete. As we know, Roman concrete is one of those Roman inventions, but also essential elements of Roman construction responsible for so many impressive monumental pieces and seemingly somehow so much better than what we have today. An important element of that was that quick lime process. Mm -hmm. And here they've had not, over, not only giant piles of lime waiting to be used, but something they're also interested in is they had large amphora jars laying around that they're thinking on the one hand 
could have simply been used to store tools. If you've been on a dig site, often the tools get put in the buckets so that they don't wander off or get kicked, but they think they may have also used these to quench some of that lime that's going into the plaster or going into the cement to help seal that process off. So the archaeology here giving us insight into some things we already know, but potentially growing our understanding of Roman concrete and maybe allowing us to access some of that technology that they had that we have seemingly gone away from. So more information from Pompeii. A lot of times it's frescoes coming out of Pompeii, this time a little more nitty gritty. Uh, mm -hmm. construction story, but an, an interesting, an interesting one here. And the second story, um, a little more modern, but dealing with archaeology, and it's an unfortunate story. It came out of a scientific journal, this one that you may have seen in some news stories, in the Science of the Total Environment Journal. A study came out about microplastics being found in soil samples, as well as in situ soil uh, within an archaeological excavation. Some of these soil samples date back to the 1980s that have been kept in the lab, so that means these microplastics were there in the 80s when they were excavated. But they also found some of these microplastics in soil samples of current sites as far down as 7 meters. And a microplastic is anything that is smaller than 5 millimeters. So these are these very, very fine pieces that often you'll see stories about them in the oceans. Here they're mm -hmm. saying we're finding this as well in the soil. They think they're getting carried down by the rainwater or natural water runoff that just pulls this down. One of the large concerns archaeologists have here, outside of the larger environmental concerns, is just if this is coming down not only into the soil samples that we have in the lab, but into the in situ layers, getting its way into the stratigraphy, this is going to complicate the way we date things as the chemical degradation of the plastics right. occur. It's going to make some of the dating difficult because this will skew things. So they're, they're looking to see how widespread is this within. This is one study. I'm sure this will foster many more studies. But mm. something that's going to be a thing that archaeologists are having to take account of going forward of how are we and our microplastics making our way into dig sites and meters, meters below ground. It's not just that top level. It's getting way down in there. Yeah, and and at least they're going to have to figure out a way to account for the potential presence of these plastics. We can assume that they weren't present in antiquity, and so how you know how do these microplastics affect all of the different, let's say, dating techniques or all of the different techniques that are used to separate things, uh, you know, soil from objects? Does that have any effect on this? And then a you know, determine how it works, and then how do you how do you account for that if there are any uh, measurements being taken after this process is done? So at least they've got to account for it. Best yeah. idea, you know, uh, out front is just to stop letting the plastics down in there. But apparently, um, this is just the reality in which we live now. Yeah, John Schofield, one of the authors of the study, said this feels like an important moment confirming that we sh what we should have expected, that what previously was thought to be pristine archaeological deposits ripe for investigation are in fact contaminated with plastics. Yeah. So yeah, it's going to be it's going to be difficult because again, it's not just top level stuff, it's samples as far back as the 80s and it's way way down there. So something mm -hmm. that archaeologists yeah, are going to have to adapt to going forward because there's seemingly no way, no way to stop them. And the science of archaeology will, they'll find there will be accommodations that come it. in. Yeah. It's just going to be another one of these layers of we've dated this, but also look at this, uh, maybe coming, right. coming from a plastic. So an unfortunate news story there, but something that you need to be aware of, especially if you're very interested in the dating uh, of these layers as these stories come along. Right. So there's your, there's your sad news piece for the day. <laughs> But let's move on to our main focus, the resurrection of Jesus. And Bob, mm -hmm. I think we need to start here with the first question, the most obvious question. What does the Bible say about the, the, the resurrection of Jesus? How does the Bible describe the resurrection of Jesus? Well, let's, let's talk about what the Bible actually says about the moment of the resurrection of Jesus. And that's it. 
you know, that's, you know, the, we, I like to it do this. It didn't freeze everybody. It didn't freeze. No, no, that's... it wasn't me. It wasn't me cutting out. That's what the Bible has to say about the moment or the, the actual process of the resurrection. It doesn't say anything. It, 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 Jesus is, you know, crucified. We have this story of Joseph of Arimathea asking to take the body. He's buried. And then it says, you know, on the third day, they go to the tomb. And we have several accounts of that. And the stones rolled away. We can look at these texts. But it says absolutely nothing about the process of the actual physical resurrection, which is interesting. Uh, or was it a physical resurrection? This is one of the things we need to get into a little later. But, but let's look at the accounts of that discovery that his body is not there and see if that gives us any hints. Well, yeah, so we do get an account of the the discovery of the empty tomb. This is a scene right. we're used to. The discovery of the empty tomb comes across in all four Gospels with some of these varying versions of events. In some cases, they show up and the stone is, uh, an angel rolls away the stone before them in Matthew. In Mark, they get there and the stone is already gone. In right. Luke, the stone is already rolled back and angels appear. John, we get no angels, but the stone, but in all of these versions, they get there to find that this is already empty. But for such an important moment, this feels like one of those scenes that they would want to describe. And that I think a lot of times we assume that they did in large part because Paul gives us kind of this version of, oh, and this is kind of what happened, but also he's not trying to tell exactly minute by minute what happened. But this feels like one of those one of those big moments. I mean, this is a poster moment for everyone now looking <clears throat> back for the Bible movies, but there's nothing here. The the entire ministry of Jesus, you have this, you know, these narratives. And then the Passion Week, it really slows down and it spreads out. And then we get to the central component of Christianity, right? The resurrection. It is the literally the climax of christianity it's the thing it's easter right it's 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 it and yet no description of it only they came back and they found that the stone was rolled away and he's gone and in one of the texts you know even the the little wrappings are folded up and they're nicely you know put away nice, nice and, tidy. and tidy nice and yeah <laughs> orderly Right. He was taught to fold his clothes, to leave his room better than when he found it. Nice, he nice and organized yes. here. Yes. That's right. But you don't have any description. Now, <clears throat> because this central aspect of Christianity was basically, whether it was on accident or whether it was on purpose or whatever, because that was left out of the four canonical gospels, this is probably why you have this account um, described in the Gospel of Peter. In the, in the second century, you have this apocryphal account in the Gospel of Peter, which uh, talks about Jesus being assisted out of the tomb by these two ginormous angels, right, that are, that are just basically helping him out of the tomb. And he's followed by this giant floating cross. So the, apparently the cross is in there with him, and he's coming out, and uh, it says, uh, while they're relating what they had seen, they saw again three men come out of the tomb, two of them sustaining the other, and the cross following them, and the heads of the two reaching the heaven. That's how big these guys are. But uh, that of him who was led by them, uh, by the hand overpassing the heavens. And when they heard the voice of the heavens saying, have you preached to those that sleep from the cross? They hear this answer, yes. So it's apparently a talking cross. So you've got this account that clearly didn't make it into the Bible, but I think that account at least exists because they're trying to at least fill in the gaps here because you don't have this narrated. You don't have the actual physical account of the resurrection being narrated. And it's kind of a big deal, especially since you've got accounts of other people being resurrected throughout the Bible, including at Jesus's crucifixion. And, and Jesus so, isn't, narrated like jesus is present in those other resurrection accounts yes. jesus resurrecting lazarus and yeah. maybe you could say like well we don't get a, a moment by moment breakdown but we get this call and response and the individual comes out but here yeah it's it, they show up and it's empty but there seemed like why why because it 
if I'm writing this, I want something. I want, at least, even if I said I didn't see it, some kind of statement regarding the, the resurrection here. You just show up, though, and, and gone. If I'm writing the resurrection of Jesus, I'm going to write it something like the resurrection of Lazarus, right? Yeah. It's going to be dramatic. It's going to be, there's going to be this, and he's going to walk out, and it's, it's going to be, and there's your evidence, right? There's your, I saw it happen. I saw him get up and walk out. I saw, But the way that we're given it, it leaves it, and, and let's be honest, it leaves it open to faith. Did they steal the body? Was he really dead? Was it a spiritual resurrection? Was it a physical resurrection? Uh, what happened? And then these guys have to decide for themselves. Uh, and again, we we look back at the Gospel of Mark and the, the original ending of the Gospel of Mark. The women show up and they're afraid. Yes. Curtain down, the end. Um, and then, you know, the reader has to decide for um, his or herself what what do I do with this? Do I believe this? Do I ignore this? What do I have to do? But these other gospel accounts, they have these long narratives afterwards. But again, it doesn't actually describe the resurrection of Jesus. There's a verse in John's accounting here in John 20 that I, I want to look at because I think this, this plays on some of what we're talking with here. John mm -hmm. 20 verse 1, early on the first day of the week, while it was still bar dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the tomb, right? So show up and it's already empty. And then verse two here. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. And so seemingly they show up and as far as this is concerned, in John here, there's, there's this bit of confusion, but not the immediate assumption that there has been a resurrection, that this right. isn't, that they took him, where did they go? We don't know. And then, yeah, we get that nice, the linen wrappings have been mm -hmm. here. But we get this moment of confusion and panic, which is seemingly like that Mark version, but not this nice, not this nice moment of faith. Yeah, it, it, you, you have this, you know, they just assume that, that he'd been taken. And then you've got this thing where, you know, one of them's running, but stops and Peter just barges on in, sees the wrappings. And yet they, they still don't quite get it. They, they did, it says, verse nine, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And so they went home. I like that. Then the disciples returned to their homes. End of comment, right? It's, they, they looked in there and that was it. And then they go home. So, you know, it goes on, but this is the, the story of the resurrection in the gospel of John. It, it, when you, when you look at that, and then when you read the story of the people being resurrected at the crucifixion of Jesus, which is at least a one line comment, yes. right? Yeah. Or how, how climactic the story of Lazarus, right? How, how much description was put into the resurrection of Lazarus. You would at least expect that in one of the gospels, but we get nothing. Well, I think we need, we should pull up the, 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 the moment regarding this, I don't know what we want to call this, regarding when the others come out of the ground here in Matthew. Let me, sorry, we're looking for, we're looking for the verse. Yeah, this is Matthew, uh, this is, as he's being crucified, uh, the text says that, you know, you know, when he, when he finally dies, right, uh, the, it, it, the earth shakes, the rocks were split, it goes dark, and then you have this kind of like in passing, and the yeah. saints who had gone on ahead uh, <laughs> came forth out of the tombs, right? Yeah, here we and, go, Matthew 27, 27, 52 is the one we're looking for. So Yeah, what does it say? The tombs, right, so this is, Jesus has just died, 52. Right. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. And then now we jump back to the centurion. But yeah, we get this story of what of whatever we want to call this raising. I always think of this as um, the corpse bride scene, where if you've seen the movie Corpse Bride, that they all come back up out of the ground for the wedding and there's this nice reunion. They go and they meet up right. with all their families. And seemingly we've got a similar situation here. 
we're not told that they immediately die again. They presumably right. go on with their lives. But I, I asked the same question here that I've always asked about the resurrection of Lazarus. And, you know, we're here in, in the, uh, the writing school, right? We're here at, in the university of Iowa. How come nobody has written? Maybe somebody has, and I just haven't read it, but the, the story of Lazarus after his resurrection and the story of all these other guys, you, you want a testimony of someone that's going to actually compel people to convert, right? That are going to compel people to follow Jesus. Let's get a hold of some of these people who were dead. You know, they had fallen asleep and they're in tombs and Jesus dies. And they, according to the Bible, are raised from the dead. I'd like to go over and, sir, um, you know, Brian, whatever, and it's maybe not Brian, but uh, let's, you know, what was it like being dead and, and how, how, what was it like coming back to life and tell me, are you a follower of Jesus now? Right. Cause it says there were the saints, right? Yeah. And, and uh, what are you going to plan on doing with this new life? You, I mean, that's the testimony I want to hear of somebody who had been dead and came back to life, but we get none of that either, which I've always found fascinating. Here, it's it's the report. You're talking to the wrong guy. You should be interviewing this other guy. But again, these guys that were raised from the dead, we don't hear we don't hear anything from them. Again, which is curious. Let's just say it's curious. It's it it's curious. Well, and then so let's move then maybe to some scenes that we do have regarding right. someone that has been raised from the dead. So we don't get anything regarding the description of the moment of Jesus's resurrection. We get that empty tomb moment. And then we get stories in that mm -hmm. period where post-resurrection, before the ascension, we get some appearances, some activities of Jesus. He's not just hanging out the whole time though, right? He comes and he goes. And one of the most famous scenes from this has to be the Doubting Thomas scene mm -hmm. in John 20. And I think it's right. it's worthwhile talking about the Doubting Thomas scene because this is something that we know so well from paintings and from sermons of this moment where Doubting Thomas and we have this story about faith. But I want to ask the question of what the real focus of this scene is. Is it about Thomas's faith or is it about, as you mentioned before, a physical or a spiritual resurrection and it can be both it can be a blend of both but it right. feels like we normally read it one specific way and i think we should push push against that a little bit for some more of what it says and so here in john 20 if we go through mm -hmm. john 20 verses 19 through 21st when it was yeah. evening on that day the first day of the week and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the jews jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So this is that first appearance. And this is right. the scene that Thomas isn't at. And so I think we right. need to start first with what's going on with the appearance, because we're about to get into a Jesus is a very physical resurrection moment, but right. doors are locked and poof. Yeah, so it says here that they're up there, the doors are locked, and yet Jesus just comes and stands among them. And so is the implication that Jesus can walk through walls? Can he just walk through doors? I mean, did he not? Did they just not write it down that he's, he's like, hey, it's Jesus, let me in, and they let him in? Did or the did secret he knock and everybody appear? knew? Right. Did he just, you know, we don't know. But the idea is that they, what does it say? They, they He showed them his hands and his side. So, hey, look. I'm, I, you know, remember the nails, remember the spear, right? So he shows them this and then uh, they rejoiced when they saw the, they knew it was him because he had been crucified. But again, the fact that he walked through the door makes one say, okay, but is this a spiritually resurrected Jesus? And it's, you know, it's, it's a ghost. Is this the ghost of Jesus that just has, you know, this, the spiritual scars or is it the physical Jesus that who just has powers, right? If he yeah. can come back from the dead, he can walk through a door. Right. We don't know. So this is the first one. And then I think the text goes on here. And I, yeah, we go on. Jesus says, peace be with you. I want to jump down to verse 25 because right. we have 24 tells us that Thomas wasn't there. And then in right. verse 25, so the other disciples tell Thomas, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, 
unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails right. and my hand in his side, mm -hmm. I will not believe. Which seemingly he's saying like, hey, listen, if you guys saw something, but if you're just seeing something that's different than feeling something, I right. need to, and whether this is in or on here, the Greek can kind of go either sure. way. Like, cause sometimes we've got, we've got on the one hand, the problem of has Jesus had any uh, healing that's occurred. Sure. And and one of these things that gets brought forward here is that the idea that there needs to be some healing They they knew Galen knew that dead bodies don't heal wounds. Once the blood stops pumping, healing can't occur. So if Jesus shows up and still has these gaping wounds, We've got a problem with that live Jesus. So some want to look at this and say, this just means on, because if it's in. Yeah. And I always have a problem when people try to apply very natural physiological rules to miracles. The guy died and he's coming back from the dead, but, you know, his blood didn't coagulate properly. The guy came back from the dead. It's a miracle. This, is, this isn't what typically happens. So all the rules are out, out the window, right? It, let's not try to apply, you know, sci, you know, medical rules to a guy who just walked through a door, right? It, right. This, this doesn't work. But you're right about the Greek, in or on. But what, what the point is, is he wants to touch. Yes. The, and, and Thomas always takes a bad rap. Because he says, hey, unless I touch him, I'm not going to believe it. Mm -hmm. And we always say, what's well, doubting Thomas? Right. But maybe this is unfair because maybe what the reason that John's telling this story is not to, to you know, dump all over John. You know, you know, you weren't as faithful as the other guys. But maybe it's to, to talk or speak to this idea that Jesus wasn't a spiritual resurrection, but he's trying to say, no, 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 it was physical. See, Thomas touched him. Now, whether it's in or on, still, he it was physical. He wasn't a ghost, is, is what they're trying to get at. I mean, what do you think? I, I think so. Because verse 27, we now get the scene where Jesus, Jesus appears again. He does this, doors are shut, round two. Yeah. I did it before, Thomas, I'm going to do it for you too. And he tells him, <laughs> put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And following up on this, verse 29 also tells us, blessed are those that believe but have not seen. But preceding this, right, that part I think is what gets latched onto that we've got this faith aspect here, which goes great with a Paul reading of, of the faith and things unseen. But here, it does feel very much like the intention. Thomas's doubting serves as a tool to foster the physicality because the other disciples seemingly aren't pushed into the position of they need to touch. They're content to see. They saw Jesus. Right. They don't ask to touch. Okay, but let's double down here and we need a physical. We need a physical resurrection. Thomas, not there. He can ask then to touch. And that lets us bring in some faith aspects, but also drive home the point that Jesus, able to do miraculous things with the walls and the door here, Right. but can also just show up if he right. wants, yep. but is physical. I'm sorry, go ahead. Is physical, yeah. you can touch him. Right. The other question we need to ask is, why Thomas? Why is it Thomas? Why isn't it one of the other disciples? Why does it specifically have to be Thomas, who John is trying to demonstrate this guy is physical? This guy is a physical resurrection. Look, you, Thomas, come here, touch him. Why is it him? You could argue, one could argue, that this is in response to um, one of the Gospels that didn't make it in to the canon, that some that we argue that is a Gnostic text, right? The Gospel of Thomas. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe this is um, a, I don't want to say a shot at Thomas, but maybe it's a way to insulate against this, mm -hmm. right? You know, there have there have to be a lot of things in place, right? Including the dating of the Gospel of Thomas and a knowledge of this, and but it it could be an, an you know, given the dating of the Gospel of John, if you say John is a little later and Thomas is a little earlier, and that Thomas was popular and he believes in this spiritual, this Gnostic, it was it was all a, a spirit, maybe. Or it could just be Thomas. But the, the, we have to also ask the question of why was it Thomas and not one of the other disciples? And there's a great comment here from 
festering boils, convenient enough for a resurrection title about, Matthew does say, this is in that ascension scene in Matthew, or ascension, not ascension, that Matthew tells us that some people, they see Jesus, but there is some doubt. But Thomas, yeah, in John's version in this room, gets singled out as, yeah, maybe it's this intercommunity in yeah. fighting of we're trying to position somebody else. But that faith aspect, it's there. It's There's definitely it talking about doubt, and it's talking about faith in this scene. But to read past the physicality aspect not only seems to read over some very important stuff in this scene, but to read over some other details in the other Gospels as well uh, regarding Jesus and food that I think we need to talk about too because there's scenes where Jesus is a part of meals, but then also scenes where Jesus is eating himself. And I think let's start maybe with one where he's a part of a meal yeah. and another identification question here and then go to one where he's eating himself. And right. for these ones, well, we're going to be talking about Luke. Yeah. While you, while you pull up that verse, it, it's, it, it's important to remember that there was an active debate early on over, over Jesus, the nature of Jesus's resurrection. And this is because there, I believe there was a debate within the text over the nature of Jesus's resurrection. I don't think everybody agreed. Why? Because it's not described. It's not described. And so wh what was he talking about? What, what will our bodies look like in the resurrection? Right? Because you have these. I when I teach this, when I teach my classes, I like to I I, I take this poll in the class. How, how many of you, if you were going to take a poll in the street, what happens if you're a Christian? If you if you polled a hundred Christians, like Family Feud, right? What happens when you die? How many of you think that your soul leaves your body and goes up to heaven to be judged or, you know, go to be judged and it goes to heaven or hell? And I get about half the hands. And then I say, how many of you think you're going to be dead and one day you will be raised and then you'll be, and I get the other half of the hands. And I said, why is that? And that's because both traditions are preserved in the New Testament, right? You have that parable of the rich man and mm -hmm. Lazarus or the, the, the poor man just Lazarus dies and then he's immediately in heaven, right? And the rich man's immediately in hell. But then you've got Paul talking about resurrection. These are both preserved and they're not necessarily compatible. Right. And I think while we're on Paul as well, we should make the point that Paul's version of resurrection kind of does compete with this if we're looking at 1 Corinthians and the nature mm -hmm. of all the things attributed to Paul is mm -hmm. again, a topic all in itself. But in 1 Corinthians 15, when he's talking about resurrection, in verse 53, for this perishable, bo perishable body must put on imperishability, this mortal body put on immortality. And so he is pushing back in 1 Corinthians against some of this, mm -hmm. well, this thing is sown, but something different is going to be resurrected. And he, he speaks to the resurrection of Jesus, but then also talks about, hey, but we're going to be doing something different in that. So there is this, yeah, if we there, want to call it was this a belief. continuity. Yeah, there was a belief, or at least there was a debate in the early church over, okay, we're going to be resurrected. Granted, what is the nature of that resurrected body? By the way, uh, am I going to be 51 or am I going to be 22? If I live to be 80, when am I resurrected as an 80-year-old or do I get to be in my prime, right? And what happens if I'm dismembered? What happens if, if I'm burned? What happens? Again, it's a miracle. So you know, once once we once we start talking about resurrection, uh, something that's a, a miracle, it defies all of the laws of physics. You know, we're making it up as we go along, right? It's it's a do do lightsabers work underwater? It's theology. We we mm -hmm. don't know, but there was a debate in the early church over what this would look like, and Paul is arguing one thing, and it looks like John is pushing back on it somewhere else with Thomas. And then we've got these other things. Jesus is apparently walking around on the earth, just making appearances, just popping up and and doing. And some of these appearances are rather funny. So, well, I think well, let's start with an appearance in Luke 24. We'll go to some eating appearances mm -hmm. here. And so in Luke 24, yeah, he's walking along. He's with two who do not recognize him. And as they get near to a village, they... He's going to say, like, I'm just going to keep going, guys. I'm going to keep going. And they urge him to stay. <laughs> and then we have this scene. They stay. When he was at the table with them in verse 30 here, mm -hmm. he took bread, blessed it, and broke it and gave it to them. So here we don't have a scene of Jesus eating, but he's a part of this meal situation. Mm -hmm. Then their eyes were opened 
and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. So this time he doesn't <laughs> vanish into their sight like we had right. in the room, but now he's broken the bread. They who couldn't recognize him now can, and he disappears. And Bob, you have an interesting idea of what, what is it in this scene? Because I've always heard in this moment of the breaking of the bread, we're going back to the Last Supper and they go, oh, and this is the thing. But you have a different thought here as well. Yeah, some people think that, oh, when they're sitting at the supper, they finally, oh, wait, oh, oh yeah, you, we did this before, right? They, but it also could be that as he's breaking this bread and passing it to them, you know, the sleeve comes up and they see the marks and they realize, oh my gosh, we didn't reckon. Oh, and then as soon as they recognize him, poof, he disappears. And again, is he physical or is he a spirit if you have the ability to just vanish? And again, that doesn't help us because we're dealing with this world where people can come back from the dead and walk through to it. So whether you're spirit or whether you're physical, all the rules are gone. And, you know, so it doesn't help us with either argument, but that's the thing. Is it this theological, oh, it's at the breaking of the bread at the table where we, where we see Jesus, or is it he physically is handing them something and they see the scars from the nails and they're like, oh, Jesus. And then he's like, ah, gotcha. Bye. And he takes off. Wh whatever, whatever it is, as soon as they recognize him, he disappears. And I, and then we go from this one, he because he disappears, they run back. Right. And let's just go to, to Luke 24 here. They run back to right. the other disciples and they're telling them what's going on. And they're, you know, they're not all the way in here. Right. And so they're talking about this. They're not believing them. Right. Jesus himself stood among them. Again, we've got another appearance here. Peace right. be with you. They're startled. They're terrified. They thought they were seeing a ghost, is what verse 37 right. says. And he says, why are you frightened? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of boiled fish. He took it and ate it in their presence. And so in this moment, it feels like we're really packing on this. Yeah, he can show up and disappear, but lots of physicality. See this. Yeah. Does a ghost do this? And then do you guys have anything to eat? And I'm going to eat it in <laughs> front of you. Yeah, right in front of him. And he's so hungry that he's willing to eat boiled fish. As, you know, as, as, you know, it's... But the, he's starving, right? Which would kind of kind of play back towards the, yeah, this is a physical body. Uh, by the way, he hasn't eaten anything for a couple of days because, you know, he's been dead. And now he'd like something to eat. Well, I'll take the boiled fish. He could turn rocks into bread, as I'm told by the Bible, but he's, he's going to wait for the boiled fish. Okay. But this is it. He's eating fish. He's wanting to be with them. By the way, the fish the loaves, the, you could draw all these theological, uh, you know, uh, ideas from it. But I think, again, it has something to do with these post-resurrection appearances. Uh, and again, he's speaking clearly, I'm not a ghost. I'm a I'm physical a ghost. being. So this is, they're trying to really drive home the physical resurrection of Jesus. And it's just, it feels like something that when we talk about this, it, a lot of times, a lot we focus on the van, the, the in and the out, the don't have doubts, and this mm -hmm. physicality aspect just gets moved past, moved past, moved past because, I don't know, we either read it our own way and we go, we're, we're just so worried about this part, but it, it is one of these concerns in the text that's easy to move past. But once you see it, once you start to look for it, it's showing up all over the place, right. that there's all these little glimmers of the physicality keep popping and keep popping and keep popping mm -hmm. and that it's hard to look past. Right. And I think with the canonical gospels, that's what they're trying to underscore. Um, yes, he can walk through walls, but he's a physical being. And again, I think it goes back. The reason that they keep underscoring this is because there was this debate over whether Jesus was merely spiritually resurrected or was he physically resurrected. And we're not going to answer that debate for you today. That's nope. that. There's nope. there's a lot to be said there that if you're right. interested in, it's a whole avenue that you can go down regarding what are the implications of this? How does this all go? But it is something that, again, in these texts that we're looking at, 
they're not uniform in their opinion. There's another passage that I want to jump on that comes back to this idea of fish, the fishing scene in John 21. And right. I mean, if I'm honest, I want to look at this one because there's a detail hidden within this part that I think we normally focus <laughs> past. That is just one of these scenes where we get these little moments in the Bible that we jump right over that I think sometimes right. we, maybe we completely forget that they're in there until someone points them back out to us. And so we're talking about John 21, when Jesus right. appears the, to the disciples and they're out fishing. And this is a scene that, again, we're used to. They're out in the boat, they're fishing, but they're having right. a rough time. The, the catch yeah. isn't going good. And this is when we get that scene where they say, have you no fish? They say, no, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. A great verse that we all know. Right. The disciple whom Jesus loved, which is usually associated with John here, said to mm -hmm. Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, and this is the moment, he put on some clothes for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only a hundred yards off. And then when they get to shore, there's the charcoal fire with fish on it and bread. He tells them to bring the fish and they have this scene of come and have breakfast. He gives them bread. They do the same with the fish. And then we get to this eating scene. But the verse that I, you know, what, it's not the most important. It's not necessarily a resurrection focus thing, but in one of these details, we got a naked man out fishing with all the guys on the boat. What's he doing in the boat naked? Now, this is always just a fun detail, right? But A... What's he doing naked in the boat with all the other men? It's what it says, right? That's what the text says. B, when he recognizes it's Jesus, he's like, oh, I better cover up. And then what? He goes out in the water, right? And so... Swims in. Swims in. He's got to get yeah, there swims first. in. So the question is, you know, why is he covering up to get in the water? Is it that once I was swimming in Turtle Creek... Man, those snappers snapping at my feet. You know, it's, there's a very, look, I went fishing with my dad just about every weekend growing up. Uh, a, I never got naked in the boat, with, you know, with these other guys, uh, just so we're clear. But I also, you know, was very careful whenever I'm swimming in a lake to make sure that I'm covered up for fear of, you know, for fear of, it, it, you want to keep all your bait in the boat, right? You want to you want to make sure that you, you don't want to. He was keeping the fish away. Maybe this is why none of the fish were coming into the net. The net it <laughs> got a naked guy on the boat. The fish are nowhere to be found. It's and again, the the big point for our resurrection focus here is that this is another eating scene again. But in this one, Jesus doesn't eat. The disciples do. But yeah, just one of these little details. There's all of these little moments that we move past because we go cast the net to the other side. Then Jesus has this nice barbecue on the shore and they're all hanging out. But in the middle, yeah, one of the disciples is naked. And I know it's not the biggest thing in the world, but just just know that this is in there. So if you're, if you're hearing a sermon this Sunday and this passage gets brought up, just say which one of them was naked and see where the conversation goes. Right. Again, I... Oh, man, Jesus is here. But put on some clothes and get get in. It's it's something to overlook. But then, then that's in the middle. That detail is in the middle of this very famous story. But we often overlook that he's just lying out there in the boat naked with the rest of the dudes. So you know who knows. But we'll we'll get maybe back. That's on why they weren't catching any fish. It's why they weren't catching any fish. But we'll get back yeah. on topic. If you're like I'm, right. I've had. Completely understand, because there's one last big moment that we need to get to before we end, and that's the ascension or non-ascension that we get within the Gospels. Because again, much like the moment of the resurrection, I think this is one of those scenes that if you if you were to poll 100 people on the street, most people have a, an idea of what does this look like. Maybe we've seen the movies, they're all on top of the mountain. Right. I think it gets blended with the transfiguration a lot of times in people's ideas, and they're all there, and they see this moment. But that's not what all of them have. And and I think let's maybe go through kind of what the four have here for a sense of scale. Because if we start with, let's start with Mark, typically identified as the oldest here. If we go to the Gospel of Mark for what it says about an ascension, verse 19, 
Mark 16, verse 19. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven, sat down at the right hand of God. So Mark, early, we do get here a version of an ascension. Maybe not at all of the moment, all the description, but Mark, nice and short, succinct. That's on brand for Mark, right? Punchy and dramatic. Mm -hmm. If we go into Matthew, which is one that we talked about earlier here as well, in Matthew, verse, verses 16, now the eleven disciples right, went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, and some doubted. And then we get this, all authority of heaven goes to you, and remember, I'll be with you always until the end of the age, and see. But we maybe we get them on the mountain here, which is what some people associate with, and then we get a commissioning scene. But Matthew, no ascension. We just, we just close the curtain, and let's move on. In Luke, mm -hmm. Luke 24... We have, he led them out as far as Bethany, lifting up his hands. He blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. However, right. a detail in this one is that not all of the manuscripts have, and he was carried up into heaven. There are right. a batch of manuscripts that just have, and he withdrew from them. And then a right. batch that come in, maybe seemingly going like, huh. Does he just disappear again? Is he just, I'm going to go camping now? We got to clarify. Right. And they add in, he says, I'm sick of you guys. I hear you fish naked. I'm right. leaving. No, they come in and they say he was carried up into heaven. Right. And so right. we don't have all these. And then John just has nothing about this at all. John ends with a scene about maybe John is going to live forever is how the gospel of John ends. But we, we right. have Mark with an ascension, Luke with... An ascension, maybe a redactionary right. ascension, and Matthew right. with not. But again, one of these moments that seems like such a big part of this resurrected right. and then ascends. Except, uh, no. Right. And I think that's why they come over here and uh, clean it up, if I remember correctly, in Acts, right? This is, they, they turn around and one of the first things that happens. And Acts is uh, one six is the yes. ascension of Jesus. Yes. So, because the Gospels are kind of back and forth on what actually happens, they come back in in the Book of Acts and they say, "No, here's what happened: Jesus ascends." And so you can clean it up, uh, you know, with with later books. Uh, I would argue, you know, like the Gospel of Peter attempts to do, even though it didn't make it into the canon, by by backfilling or filling in some of these stories. But I, but I, again, will point out there is, and this contributes to this ongoing debate about whether or not this is the physical Jesus or the spiritual Jesus. Because then you have to ask the question, is this a physical body ascending into the sky, or is it the spiritual Jesus ascending into the sky? Um I think that's at the heart of this debate. That's at the heart of the resurrection. And again, the guy that I know that that you know loves to talk about this particular thing is James Tabor, mm -hmm. right? He, this is this is what he's been talking about. This is an area of his research that he focuses on. Uh, and I encourage you to go over and and watch his channel and and look at some of the things because this is one of the things that he is really uh, zoomed in on is this early debate between. Uh, whether Jesus was a phys was physically resurrected or whether he was spiritually resurrected, that seems to be the argument um, in the early church. Well, and in Acts, I pulled this up on screen here for everyone because, yeah, this is a moment that I think we gravitate towards because it does flush this out, filling in where the Gospels don't. But again, in this, he does his commissioning. He was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight while he was going up, gazing towards heaven. Suddenly, two men in white robes stood by them. Men of Galilee, why are you standing looking up into heaven? He's been taken. But in this, we get this blend of physical and physically resurrected and then spiritual. And we do we get this mesh together, which if we're thinking right. of if he's physically, physically being resurrected and he's physically ascending up, where does he physically end up? So we do then have to go back to, OK, if he was physical and it was a physical ascension here, at some point it still has to revert back to a spiritual otherwise either he continues flying at light speed for to where 
or if we go towards the dome worldview of is he gonna yeah. hit the dome and and bust through is it like what well, so yeah he's gonna yeah. hit the he's gonna hit the rek yeah right he's gonna hit the dome that god created in in genesis one because they weren't aware that you know the the size of our universe the expanse of our universe he can't still, you know, the, our universe is so big that if you're still traveling, even at light speed, you're still in our universe where, you know, where is heaven? So it's obviously operating within that Genesis one, you know, that ancient Near Eastern worldview, there's a dome up there and you get up. But again, we can't have the debate over whether or not he's physically or spiritually, because it's, we're, we're talking about a resurrected human and that doesn't happen. And so once you resurrect from the dead or you claim to resurrect from the dead, all the rules are off. You can walk through a door, you can ascend, you can fly, you can vanish, you can appear, you can, and that's what's going on. And so again, trying to argue whether or not this is the physical Jesus or the spiritual Jesus is essentially an impossible argument because he has it, it is after he has done something that you can't do as a physical human being you resurrected from the dead which is probably why we don't get any interviews from lazarus and we don't get any interviews from the walking dead that come back after jesus is is crucified that's probably why we don't have what are they going to say are they a lot are they spirits are they physical it's so they they don't even bother to Either they made that story up or they don't know how to, what do you say about that? Which is why they're not, they're not talking about this because you're dealing with miracles. And once you're dealing with miracles, all the rules of physics are out the window. And that, you know, that I, I've said that three times now, but once you're dealing with miracles, you cannot try to apply the rules of science or the rules of physics or it's a miracle. You're either going to believe this or you're not. But that didn't stop the gospel writers from trying to argue that Jesus was physically resurrected right. against those who, who who argued that he was only spiritually resurrected. And and going through all of this, our, the, the point of this conversation is, and we're going to come down and we have the final say here of one way or mm -hmm. another, but is just, again, putting the, the light on the diversity of traditions sometimes right. contradicting or competing or working together, but that there's there's a diversity of thought of exactly what does this mean that as modern readers or right. depending on your engagement, if you're just getting this presented to you and you're not engaging with the text, that these are, all of these things aren't necessarily at the forefront of your mind of what is the physical concern versus the spiritual concern in one text versus another, and what does this say about the ancient community? Once it comes to a position of, of an individual faith perspective for you or not for you, that's a different right. question. But but it is, again, the Bible is a complicated and diverse text with lots of opinions. And so putting the light on these things right. isn't bad. It's not to say that you have to pick, but you, you should be aware. I think we should be aware that there is. What's the moment of the resurrection? We don't right. get that described. So if someone is describing that, that's come later or that's being filled in. What is right. the physical or spiritual? There's arguments here. What does right. the ascension look like? Well, where are we looking at Mark? Has something but later or Luke or John or not there. So this is just some of the complications that in, in a moment that is so personal to so many people right. and connected to a day that means so much to so many people. It's not to say that you can't have faith or feelings or individual perspectives, but there is a complexity behind the tradition that I think mm -hmm. needs to be respected as well that can help us understand the positions of other faiths and feelings and perspectives. Well said. I think that's very well said. I, I think that there is as much debate and diversity today as there was back then. And an attempt to try to harmonize everything in a text that was wrestling with this diversity uh, is not doing justice to the text. Right. Uh, when you try to take all the things in the Hebrew Bible and make them say one thing, it's it's just as hard to do as trying to take all of the different opinions in the New Testament and trying to make them say one thing. There was a diversity of opinion. And uh, what we see coming through, whether it's 
Paul not getting along with uh, Peter and James, right? Uh, they didn't agree on things. And these fights play out, Acts 15, right? The, the, there was a difference of opinion. And here, I think what we're seeing, and the reason we don't get a lot of these texts, is there was a, a, an argument, a debate over whether Jesus was physically or spiritually resurrected with the physical resurrection of Jesus winning out. Mm -hmm. And that's why we see these kind of odd texts because he's still supernatural. It's still post-resurrection. So he can do things that he that wasn't necessarily doing early on, but they want to, they're trying to at least emphasize the physical nature. Look at my wounds. Mm -hmm. Look at me eat this fish and please put on some clothes before you come see me. If that's all that you take away from this, right. then you've got a fun fact for a Bible <laughs> trivia quiz at some point in the future. But yeah, I'd say as you're as you're going into your Easter weekend, whatever your yeah. perspective is, respecting and understanding the complexity here, because yes, it is it is a diverse tradition and the texts are happy to sit next to each other, not necessarily yeah. always in agreement. And I think we should allow them to do that. For everyone that joined us live here today for this discussion, thank you so much for being here and for the great conversation in the chat. We really appreciate having you here live with us. We're happy to see you. Again, next Friday, if you're coming in mid-show, next Friday is a Bible and Archaeology live free-for-all. That is a questions-based episode, so feel free to join us live if you want to submit questions in the chat there. We'll get to some questions from the chat. If you're wanting to leave a comment on this video, if you're watching on replay that we didn't get to, we'll pull some questions from comments. But the best way to make sure that your question will be answered is to join us on Patreon, and there you can contact us and send a question that you know will be answered mm -hmm. in that free-for-all. But if you're coming to a free-for-all, you can jump on in, you can throw things into the chat. It's basically like drop-in hours with Bob. We'd love to have you there next Friday. Keep an eye out for a time of day that's going to go. Again, a lot of things are happening, so we're, we're testing some different times to see what works for everyone. We're happy to see everyone that's here with us today for this discussion. And if you liked this, feel free to subscribe. Visit us at Bible and Archaeology. All the links are down in the description. Bob, is there anything that you want to leave with as we as we wrap up today? No, I'm, I'm still thinking about fishing. Uh, so I'm uh, happy Easter. Um, to everyone, I hope you have a great weekend. Go Hawks. Go Hawks. I hope we shoot straight. And uh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm glad you're here with us. Thank you so much for taking the time and for chatting uh, in the room there. Uh, next weekend, free for all. Um, come loaded with some questions. We'll have a lot of fun. We'll have a great time. We look forward to seeing you there. For Bob Cargill, I'm Jordan Jones. This has been Bible and Archaeology. We look forward to seeing you soon. Once I was...